Integration by parts is a very common type of problem that you'll have to be familiar with when you're learning about calculus. And in one of my weekly live streams that I did recently, which I'm doing every Monday night at five o'clock Pacific, I went over how to integrate the function x squared times cosine of mx dx. And this is a pretty interesting example. So I wanted to show you the portion of that live stream where I went over that problem because not only is this a good example of how to apply integration by parts, but it's also a great example of what it looks like when you have to do integration by parts two times in one problem, which makes it kind of challenging, but also pretty interesting. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the example and I'll show you what I'm talking about. We are going to evaluate the integral, which is the integral of x squared times cosine of mx dx. So in this case, m is we're going to treat as an unknown constant. So this is not a variable, it's just a constant. Basically, this would be the same as saying like the integral of x squared times cosine of 4x or pi x or whatever. Um, m is just going to be some unknown constant. Again, same same kind of process like we did in the last example. The first thing we need to do, first step of any integration by parts problem, is to first just figure out what do you want to make u and what do you want to make dv. So this is really not too different from the, the last example we did. Because again, if you have sine or cosine, usually it doesn't really matter whether you take the derivative or the antiderivative. The derivative of sine and cosine or the antiderivative of sine and cosine they only differ from each other by a constant. So if we're taking the derivative of this term or the antiderivative, it's not really going to be any less or more complicated. It's just going to differ by a constant, which when you're integrating, you can just pull the constant out of the integral, which means it's really going to make no difference in the integration process. However, looking at this term here, x squared, let's think very quickly, what's the derivative of x squared? Well, the derivative of x squared is just one. If we're taking the derivative with respect to x, which we know because we have a dx at the end of our integral. And then if we're taking the antiderivative of x, we would find that just using the power rule. I'm sorry, the derivative of x squared is not one. I did that too fast. The derivative of x squared using the power rule is going to be 2x. Okay. Then the antiderivative of x squared using the power rule is going to be one third x cubed. We would raise our power whereas here we're lowering our power. So usually if you have a, a power function or a you know polynomial as one of your possible options for u versus dv, typically, and I'm not gonna say always because depending on what your other term is, you might wanna you know, do something differently, but typically taking the derivative of a power function like this where you have your variable raised up to a constant function. Whether you take the derivative or the antiderivative, you're just gonna do that using the power rule, right? Which means you're either gonna lower the power by one or raise the power by one. Typically, it's gonna be better to lower the power by one because each time you do this, if we think about, you know, maybe the situation where we have to do integration by parts multiple times, which I, I believe this is gonna be one of those examples, and we'll see why in a minute. Each time you lower your power by one, eventually you'll get to a constant. So let's think about this. If we then take the derivative of 2x, that's just going to be 2. We get to a constant. And that'll make more sense as we kind of work through this. But the point is, if you have a power function, you usually want to make it your u because you want to lower your power and get to a point where your function is going to be easier to deal with rather than more complicated to deal with. You know, Because if we raise our power and get x cubed, uh, you know, if we do take it a step further and take the antiderivative of this term again a second time through the problem, we're going to end up with an x to the fourth term. And you know, if that keeps going, it's never going to reach an end. It's just going to kind of infinitely loop. And again, I'll, I'll explain a bit more of kind of what that means and why that's significant in a minute as we work through this. But for now, let's go ahead and just say that our u is going to be x squared. Our dv is going to be the cosine mx dx. So then, again, this next step of an integration by parts problem, once you have determined what your u and your dv are, you're just going to find du and v. You just find du by taking the derivative of u, so the derivative of x squared is 2x by the power rule, the antiderivative of cosine of mx dx. You know, if you wanted to think about how to actually solve this, you could do this using u substitution. Um, I'm not going to go into all that because it's going to work basically the same for you know any constant times x in here. Um, 
but if you want to you know try that on your own that would be a good exercise for you um you but you could integrate this with u substitution if you do that what you're going to find is the integral of cosine times some constant times x is going to be sine of mx um, times one over m and we can quickly kind of check this just by thinking about go in the other direction so instead of taking the antiderivative if we took the derivative of this term here this 1 over m times sine of mx we would do this using the chain rule and what you would find is the derivative of sine is cosine and then by chain rule we would have to multiply by the derivative of mx which would be m multiplying by m would cancel with this 1 over m getting us back to cosine of mx so that's just kind of a quick check um, and then we do also need our dx over here. dx is always going to be with du and with dv. So now, once we have that, we can use our integration by parts formula. Um, again, this integration by parts formula is on my integral calculus cheat sheet. Link is down in the description or the pinned comment where you can check that out. Um, but that formula just says if we have the integral of u times dv, which is what we started with, right? We had u here and dv here. The integral of u times dv can be rewritten as u times v minus the integral of v times du. Perfect. So now we can just apply this formula, which basically just means we're going to take take our u, or I'm sorry, our u, our v, and our du and plug them into this formula. So we know that this integral we started with is going to be equivalent to u times v, so x squared times 1 over m sine of mx, which would be the same as 1 over m x squared sine of mx minus the integral of v times du so this whole thing here times 2x dx so 1 over m times 2x sine of mx dx okay so now here's the interesting thing about this problem we still have an integral that's not super easy to deal with right we still have like an x times a sine of mx in here that's not super easy to deal with so it kind of seems like maybe this was a dead end but this goes back to what i was kind of touching on previously of having to use integration by parts twice in one problem it's not all that uncommon that you would have to do something like that and it happens a lot when you have a power function times a trig function. And that goes back to what I was saying before. If we imagine taking the derivative of now this 2x term, that derivative is just going to be a constant. So basically the power each, each iteration through is going to keep on going down and down and down. So basically whether we had, uh, you know, x squared times some trig function or x to the 100th power times some trig function, we could keep applying integration by parts, being sure to take the derivative of the, you know, x to the n power each time. And each time we'd get one iteration closer to an answer. Um, of course, that would be a long mess of a problem. But, uh, you know, having just x squared is a little bit more manageable. But let's kind of simplify this a bit and then I'll kind of show you what I mean. What we have out here outside the integral is not going to change at all. We're still just going to have 1 over m x squared times sine of mx minus and then we can pull the 1 over m because m is a constant we can pull the constant out of our integral and we can also pull this 2 which is a constant out of our integral so we're going to have 2 over m times the integral of x times sine of mx dx okay so again now we can do the exact same process this time we can say again our u is going to be x because we want to keep taking the derivative of that x or x squared term and then our dv is going to be this sine of mx dx term so one quick note really with with any integration by parts problem where you have to apply integration by parts more than once or applying integration by parts twice in one problem whatever you make whichever term you made your u the first time through you typically want to pick the, you know, the resulting term that corresponds with that one, your u again the second time. And, you know, therefore, whatever was your dv the first time, the term kind of corresponding with that is going to be your dv the second time. So in this case, our trig function was our dv both times. And then the x or the x squared term was our u both times. And you would want to continue that pattern if you had to apply 
integration by parts, you know, more than twice in the same problem. This trig would want to continue on as DV and, you know, this other term, which the power would continue lowering, like I keep saying. And that's because we would keep on taking the derivative of that term rather than switching to then taking the antiderivative, which would kind of just undo the previous step. So again, now we're going to do the exact same process we did for the first half of this problem. We're going to take the derivative of x, which is just one. And then we have our dx here. And then we're going to take the antiderivative of our dv term, which pretty similar to what we did in the last time through. We're just going to get one over m negative one over m times cosine of mx. Because again, if we imagine taking the derivative of this by chain rule, the derivative of negative cosine, because negative cosine starts with a positive slope. So the, the derivative of negative cosine is positive sine. And then by chain rule, we have to multiply by the derivative of this inside term here. The derivative of mx is just m, which would cancel with one over m. So just kind of a quick check there. So then we can apply, again, this integration by parts formula. So we're going to get the integral of u times dv is just going to be equivalent to u times v, so x times negative 1 over m cosine mx. So uh, negative 1 over m x cosine mx u times v minus the integral of v times du. So minus the integral of v times du. Well, one dx is just dx basically. So minus the integral of negative one over m cosine mx dx. Okay. And then the rest of this is just going to carry on down. So we're just going to have all this stuff here that was outside the integral. Basically, this piece here is just equivalent to this integral that we had here. So the two over m is going to remain being multiplied by all this stuff because all this stuff is equivalent to the integral here. And then the rest is just going to remain exactly as it was. So now we can simplify this a bit further before we worry about this, this integral here. We're not done yet. We do still have an integral here, so we have to integrate still. But let's go ahead and simplify this a bit. So uh, this term is not going to change, but we will want to distribute this negative 2 over m into the parentheses here because inside here we have these two terms here. So let's do that. 1 over m x squared sine mx is going to stay out here. Uh, minus 2 over m times negative 1 over m is plus 2 over m squared uh, times x cosine mx. And then negative 2 over m times negative. And actually, let's go ahead and pull this negative 1 over m out of our integral because it is just a constant. We can just pull it out like that. So pulling that out, it, we're going to have a negative here a negative here and a negative here. Three negatives times each other makes a negative. And that's just because we are, uh, we're distributing this whole term here in to the parentheses to this term here. So I know this is getting kind of messy, um, but negative, negative, negative makes a negative. Two over M times one over M gives us two over M squared. Okay. And then, so that's accounted for this uh, 2 over m distributing in. We still have, we've also pulled this one, negative 1 over m out of our integral. So we still have the integral itself, and we're taking the integral of cosine mx dx. So now we still have to integrate this cosine mx dx. Well, now this is not any more complicated than the integrals we've already done. We've already integrated sine of mx dx. And before that, we actually already integrated cosine of mx dx. So now we have an integral which finally, after applying integration by parts twice, finally we have an integral that's actually simpler to evaluate than the one we started with. Well, we already found out that the integral of cosine mx dx is 1 over m sine mx. So basically, this whole thing here is just 1 over m 
sine mx. We already figured that out the first the first time applying integration by parts. So we can kind of just plug that in for what's in the box here, this integral. Um, and then again, we still have this minus 2m squared being multiplied or minus 2 over m squared being multiplied by that. So, um, you know, 2 over m squared times 1 over m is just 2 over m cubed. So we'll go ahead and simplify that. Okay, and then the rest of this is just going to carry on down. There's not any, uh, you know, integrating to do with any of this. We've already done the integration part of all this. Um, if there were some more simplifying to do, we definitely could do that. But fortunately, we took care of all that already on the last step. So this should be the fully simplified version of our solution. So this here now is the integral based on using integration by parts twice of this original function that we started with up here. Well, I hope you found that video helpful. If you did, please be sure to hit that like button down below and subscribe while you're down there too. It's a huge help to my channel so I can keep making more videos like this and we can keep growing the Jake's Math Lessons community. And if you did find this video helpful, you'll probably find my weekly live streams helpful too. Like I said, I've been doing those every Monday night at five o'clock Pacific. Be sure to join me next week and uh, maybe you can get your questions answered live. But in the meantime, if you wanna keep learning about integrals, I have made several other videos about that. Just go ahead and click on one of those videos over there and hopefully I'll see you on Monday.